Well, uh, as you as usual, you know, last year, welcome to the global virtual lecture hall. Welcome to the Shanghai lectures. Uh, for those who have participated in the past, and that's many of you among you, you are aware of all the technological glitches that are uh, possible, and so we're experiencing some of these. <laughs> glitches. I mean, it's it's a bit ironic because video conferencing has been around for at least 40 years or almost half a century, and still, you know, it's a challenge to set it up like uh, every week. Uh, so I'm I'm very happy that uh, Fabio uh, is taking over. He is now at the IROS conference in Tokyo. IROS is the largest, as you all know, is the largest or one of the largest robotics conferences in the world, which is now placing, uh, taking place in Tokyo. So we have some additional challenges uh, for the uh, connectivity. Okay, so I'm uh, very happy to be here. So Fabio told me to talk about evolution cognition from scratch. And I will try to finish maybe uh, uh, relatively quickly because we are a bit, we are running a bit late this time. So for next week, um, I think it would be nice um, if someone could volunteer to give a short presentation about the brain in the VAT. I mean, just very briefly. So the brain in a VAT is a um, thought experiment, and it's interesting because the idea is to remove a brain. It's especially interesting from a perspective of embodiment because the idea is to remove a brain from the body, put it into a nutritious solution, and then you know the question is, what does this brain actually experience? How is it connected to the real world? What's going on there? And there's an interesting discussion of this thought experiment in Alva Noe's book, uh, Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain, which I think is very much to the point, the philosophical perspective on embodied intelligence. I can highly recommend the book, and it would really be great if someone could volunteer, so please send mail to uh, Fabio if you're interested. So we need a volunteer for a short presentation. Okay, well, having said that, we all are familiar with the time perspectives. You know, there's the here and now, which is the dynamical system. There's the ontogenetic perspective, which is about, um, there is the ontogenetic perspective, which is about uh, the lifetime of the individual learning and development. And there's the phylogenetic one that you, you can see at the, uh, at the bottom here. And this is about uh, many generations, and I'll be talking about the phylogenetic perspective today. Now here is when you're designing a system in the evolutionary or phylogenetic perspective, then you have to design the evolutionary mechanisms, and then there is a lot of room for emergence, then you let the system run uh, on its own. Now just to give you an idea of the power of these evolutionary methods, there is a historic example that I like very much. It's uh, Rechenberg's fuel pie problem, Rechenberg at the Technical University of uh, Berlin, an evolutionary uh, robotics or evolutionary or an engineer who has been exploiting, he was one of the first in the 1960s to actually use ideas from evolution to solve problems in engineering. Now, if you look at this, at the one that we have here, then uh, let me see if I can, uh, ah, oops, I think I'm, I'm uh, running into problems here. Ah, uh, yep, yeah. so, right. Okay, so now, what is the fuel, uh, Reichenberg's fuel pipe problem. So the fuel is coming in here, and then for it needs to be 
deflected to run in this direction. And his question was, what is the optimal shape of the connecting piece here, such that turbulences and energy waste are minimized so that the flow is smooth? And uh, decades of engineers, you know, what is the answer? They have thought, well, this is actually a quarter circle. Well, I'm not very good at drawing this. So it's actually a quarter circle. I mean, that's basically the obvious solution to this problem. Now, he built a device in which he had for this piece here, he actually had a flexible shape. And he could adjust, basically, he could uh, make any shape of this connecting piece. And then he was using an evolutionary algorithm that he was, in fact, uh, suggesting. It's called evolution strategy. And he found, after many generations, that the optimal shape is, in fact, something like this. So there is kind of a hunch here. And if you do the physics now of this problem, then you find that this is indeed the better solution than the other one. So I think it's an extremely powerful way of, uh, or extremely powerful method. And the question that we can actually ask here, and I think it's a suitable place to ask this question, is can computers be creative? Uh, here, I would argue, I mean, generations of engineers have come up with a solution that is, in fact, non-optimal, but an evolutionary method, such as the one developed by Rechenberg, has found a better solution. So has the computer program been creative or not? Maybe someone from the global virtual lecture hall would venture a statement here whether uh, computers or whether this is actually creative or not. Would someone volunteer? We can also discuss this topic maybe next week. We can give it as an assignment, think about it, and uh, we have a chat about this next week. Okay, now it turns out that, you know, if you look at, by the way, on the top left A, panel A, you see the arrangement that Reichenberg made for achieving these flexible shapes. There is also uh, the antenna that you see on the right, and there is, in fact, at the GECKO conference, which is the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference, there is or has been a human competitive design competition. And one of the, that was a few years ago, one of the competitions was to design an antenna for a satellite. And, in, and that's a very complicated problem. And indeed, the shapes, the antennas designed by an evolutionary algorithm outperformed the ones designed by uh, the human engineers. So again, you know, the question, can we call these computers creative or not? Now, one of the reasons that the Rechenberg problem is so difficult might actually be the following. So there is this puzzle. And the question, so I have a square, four corners of a square. And the task is to connect these four corners of the square with three straight lines ending up in the starting corner. Now, how can we do this? Does anyone have a suggestion? Would anyone? Uh, Want to give it a try? Someone from Xi'an? Okay. Your mic's maybe on, can, yeah. Maybe we can draw a triangle uh, and... Uh, a, a triangle? 
啊。No, the, uh, How about like this? Yeah, 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 in this way. And the, okay. Right, that's what I'm doing. right. So the point is that we normally, when we see something like that, we constrain ourselves to the inside of the square. And if you're looking for a, a solution inside the square, you're actually lost. You have to go beyond the square, but it seems that we're just built in this way that we impose, unknowingly, we impose constraints on the whole thing. Okay, so let's talk a bit more in detail about artificial evolution. I think it was, uh, so one of, some of the main contributors have been John Holland, Ingo Rechenberg at the Technical University of Berlin and John Cosa in the United States. And Holland's method is typically called the GA or genetic algorithm, the one of Rechenberg evolution strategy and Cosa has been working with genetic programming. Now, the main concept to understand in evolution and of course in artificial evolution is cumulative selection. So Richard Dawkins, he wrote this book, The Blind Watchmaker, and he's also the author of The Selfish Gene and of Climbing Mount Improbable, The Blind Watchmaker, where he explains the concept of cumulative selection. And the idea is basically uh, that you have this mutation, we will look at that a bit more in detail, you have a mutation, and then some of the organisms will die, you know, after the mutation, some will survive, some will get better. And so there is always selection on what's, what has already been there. So evolution builds on what has been achieved so far. And you have to be careful with uh, evolution you know, the, especially when we, talk, when we talk about intelligence. People talk about intelligent design and then we think, ah, wow, intelligent design, but these are the creationists. They are against evolution and in the United States, you know, still these creationist ideas are actually taught in school. And Richard Dawkins is very outspoken against the creationism, so we have to be careful. Now, the concept of cumulative selection can be explained also by what's called aesthetic selection. So there is this idea of biomorph, so these are basically creatures like this, and then we have to encode somehow this creature in the genome as a string of numbers. Expression of the gene in this case means a producing a particular graphical appearance and then we have a selection of individuals for reproduction based on a fitness function. And in this case, fitness is aesthetic appeal to the user. So you say, okay, well, maybe I like this one best. And then I choose this one. And then there is mutation and the new, creation, new creatures are being produced. And you can continue like that. And it should be getting better and better for you, more aesthetic for you. So there is a... In the slides, you can find a web page. Please go to the web page and study the Blind Watchmaker applet. Actually, it's very fun to play with it. We don't have time to do it in the class. So the term biomorph goes back to the surrealist painter Desmond Morris, who has uh, written many or illustrated many, many books. And then you always, one of the things you always have to do, you have to find a representation in the genome. So in this case, genes one through eight control the overall shape, gene nine, depth of recursion, genes 10 to 12, the color, and so on and so forth. And this is basically the grand evolutionary scheme. You will find that there is a huge literature on uh, artificial evolution and evolution, of course, now, all these approaches, or almost all the approaches, can be mapped on this grand, what we call the grand evolutionary scheme. 
So you have a certain problem, you have to define a genotype, then you have a process of development which includes the interaction with the environment. This will give you the phenotype, we are the phenotypes, the real physical organisms that interact in the real world. We have an interaction with the environment, competition with other agents in a particular ecological niche. We have a process of selection. Some of the individuals are better than others. And we get a new population and then we have reproduction. And the whole process starts over again. And there are different encoding schemes, different developmental schemes, different selection schemes, and different reproduction schemes. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. This is just the illustration from how the body shapes the way we think, but it's essentially the same thing. OK, uh, now let's look at an example how we can evolve a controller, a neural controller for a robot. So assume that we have a robot like this one. We have sensors. So this is like the Kepler robot, you know, this round, small robot. So we have sensors here and uh, we have uh, motors two motors and here we have the wheels that you can see here and here and now we need to let's see what do we need to specify here what do we need to specify oops how can I erase this uh, clear ink. Yeah, uh, what do I need to specify? I need to specify the architecture of the network so I can connect. Uh, here we go. Hmm. Uh, I have some technological issues with the ink program, so let's just do it. Let's just do it virtually. Uh, yeah, I think I have a crash here. Let me see if I can recover from the crash. OK, let's just continue without the ink. So I need to connect the sensors to the motors here, like this. So that's how many connections? That's three sensors to motor one and three sensors to motor two. That's six. So we have six connections in the network, six links. And what do we need to do? We need to encode them in the genome, and then we can let evolution find the weights of these connections. And here is a, an example. Here you can see an example of an encoding in the genome. So we have four, uh, six connections, six links in the neural network. This is the first one, just a binary encoding of this, the second one, the third one, and so on. And we can calculate the numerical values of uh, these links, which is you know, an easy, straightforward thing to do. And then what, what we need to do is we need to have for the selection. So here we have the genotype. We did that. The development is very trivial. We just need to load the neural network into the real robot. Then we have the phenotype, and then the phenotype interacts with the real world. Now, the, the question is, what could be a sensible fitness function? It depends, of course, on what we want the robot to be able to do. Now, what could be a sensible thing that the robot should do? Maybe, yeah. What would be a sensible thing that the robot should be able to do? I guess one idea could be that the robot should move as far as possible without hitting obstacles. So we would come up with a fitness function that has two components. One component is the distance traveled in a particular time frame. And the other one would be a punishment, so to speak, for hitting obstacles. And then we want to maximize this function, and for that, we can use uh, artificial evolution.
Okay, so we basically have a binary encoding of the neural network and then the development is, is relatively simple, just loading the network into the real robot and then we have to select and so the idea is what I should have mentioned there in evolution, artificial evolution, these are all population based algorithms. So we always need a population. I was just demonstrating a single robot, but we need a population of many robots, maybe 100 robots, maybe 200 robots, which is a bit difficult to do in the real world. That's why many people prefer to work with simulation. And then you have to ha apply the fitness function and then you have to select. And one possible strategy is elitism, which is you just take the 10, let's say, the 10 best ones and they can reproduce. Uh, and that may not be such a good idea because it's very, if you do this, it's very easy to get stuck in a local minimum. So what people prefer to do is really this roulette wheel so that you assign a probability of being selected which is proportional to the fitness. So robots with a high fitness will have a higher probability of being selected and low robots with a low fitness a lower probability. But still the probability is there. And this is a way in which you can keep the diversity in the population and avoid premature convergence into a local minimum. And here you can, and then you can apply uh, to the new population crossover and uh, mutation. So crossover is very simple. You take the genome, you randomly select a crossover point in two, also you have to select two, a crossover point, and then you just exchange these parts like this. And then you get two new individuals. And the hope is, of course, that the combination of, of this part of the genome with this part of the genome will have better properties than, you know, for example, this one or this one. And then you, you have mutation. You select one of the bits randomly and then with a certain probability you sw switch, you just swap the disk. Uh, the, the bit from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. Now the question is, how do you choose the mutation rate? Uh, would anyone want to comment on that, how you choose mutation rate? Do you make it large, do you make it small? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, from um, uh, University Carlos Tercero in Leganes. We have a student who wants to try to answer the question. Okay, excellent. Madrid? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, the question is uh, why a mutation is important? Well, the question is how large would you choose the mutation rate? Mm, I guess because uh, uh, <coughs> uh, if, if 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 not right with uh, mutation, the can you talk a bit more into the microphone, a bit louder? Uh, hi. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I guess is a uh, uh, mutation is important uh, in a large process because uh, the the evolution uh, finish very short if no exist a mutation. But with mutation, uh, the the population is more uh, um, more more large for try to find a good uh, 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 um, a, a good process. Right. So right. So we uh, it's uh, basically the idea is to keep the diversity in the population. You know that they don't converge. Uh, onto uh, a single solution uh, or converge into a local minimum. And how large should the mutation rate be chosen? Should it be large? I mean, muta mutation rate being a probability that there is actually a mutation. Should it be large or should it be small? Or how, how would you choose it? 
and think about the idea of cumulative selection. So if you choose, for example, uh, the mutation rate like 0.5, it's almost like random search, right? If you make it too small, then you don't have enough diversity in the population. So basically you want to make it small so that you can benefit from the effect of cumulative selection, but still you manage to maintain the diversity in the population. I think you can, you can think about that, but it, uh, it, uh, it makes sense you can think about this in terms of search. Okay, now let's talk briefly. How much time do I have left, Nathan? Um, basically about 10 more minutes, but we don't know yet whether we can get Verena's talk in, so maybe you can just continue for a bit and then we have a break and continue with the guest lecture by Hector. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'll continue for a bit. So there are several approaches to evolutionary robotics. So using evolution to uh, design robots, and we saw one example where the robot was given and we evolved the control. So this is basically this approach. And the other approach, the more embodied approach, is to have co-evolution of control and morphology. These arrows are a bit off target here. So the, I think the, we've seen this example. This is what most people actually do in evolutionary robotics. I think the more interesting approach is really this one where you have co-evolution of morphology and control. And the first one was in fact Carl Sims. He was, uh, which was like uh, quite some time ago, maybe 12 years ago, 15 years ago, Carl Sims, a computer graphics person, and he wasn't really interested in artificial intelligence. He was more interested in cool, creating cool creatures, cool animations. And so what he did, you know, he had these creatures like this, and we will uh, upload a video of Carl Sims' evolved creatures to the web page, it's about 12 or 14 minutes long, so this would take up too much time here, but it's very interesting to watch, very instructive to watch, so please watch Carl Sims' uh, video. The way it works is as follows. So if you want to ev co-evolve morphology and control, you somehow have to encode not only the neural network in the genome, but also the um, morphology and what he did he had he created a particular representation if it were just a string of zeros and ones then it will be very difficult to encode for example a structure like that but if you have a graph structure you know where you have a segment and then you have these arrows which basically mean repeat, they add a segment, so you, have, you start here, then you add one segment on the left, one on the right, and then you do the same here, so you have a so-called recursive encoding, you can do similar things for a structure like that, or a more complicated one, like this. And then you have the development is simply mapping this structure onto an embodied phenotype here, which is then a physical structure, and Sims simulated the physical structure in the real world. Now embedded into each, and you will find uh, uh, more description on the website, embedded into each of these components there are sensors, actuators, and neural connections. So basically you have this physical system and embedded into it, you have a neural network with sensors and actuators. And so you evolve basically the whole thing here. Now, about 10 years later, at the Brandeis University in Boston, Lipson and Pollock started working on Golem. Now, what they had, they had robots, so and the robots were like bars, actuator, neurons. This is the stuff that needs to be encoded into the uh, genome, 
they did a very similar thing as Carl Sims, except that uh, you know the sh basic shapes were a bit different. They were rod instead of these uh, segments. But essentially, the whole thing is the same. Now, the, the clever thing that they did is they ran the simulation, uh, they ran the evolutionary algorithm in simulation, and when they came up with creatures that could actually move, similar to Carl Sims's creatures, they added a 3D printer at the end, so automatically the structure was produced, was printed. Uh, except that the actuation and the actuators had to be manually inserted there, but then they claimed that for the first time in the history of mankind, they have actually built a self-reproducing machine. Now the problem of the approach was that the simulation is very nice, there was no feedback from the real physical robot to the actual evolutionary process, which would be necessary if you really want to have self-reproducing machines. So they claim Golem, I was actually, I think it was in the New York Times, Golem as the first self-evolving machine in history. I mean, it's fascinating, but I think we have to be careful about these claims. Now there is an even more interesting approach to embodied evolution, and that is genetic regulatory networks. So basically you have a genetic algorithm and then embedded in the genetic algorithm you have a developmental system which is based on a very simple model of genetic regulatory networks that actually control or guide the growth of the uh, agent from a single cell to a complete organism. And then, again, as in the case of Carl Sims, the phenotypes were tested in physically realistic simulations. And just to give you, you find more details in the slides, but to give you an idea, I will, I'm going to play a video. So here is the growth phase. We start with a single cell. So in this cell, you can have sensors, you can have actuators, you can have a neural connections, and then the genetic regulatory network will guide the growth of the agent, and here this would be sort of an adult agent that will then be tested in the physically realistic uh, simulation. And I think here we could show the video, evolution of a block pusher, I think it's a very fascinating uh, video. Artificial ontogeny is a system for automatically evolving virtual robots or agents in a three-dimensional physics-based simulation for various user-defined tasks. In our first set of experiments, we evolved agents to push a large block in their environment as far as possible during a fixed time period. Here we see an agent growing from a single starting sphere into a set of connected spheres. These spheres are loosely modeled on biological cells, but also serve as the basic mechanical unit from which the agent is constructed. Each unit contains a complete copy of the genetic information shaping the growth of the agent, as well as sensors, motors, and neural structure. As these units grow and divide, so too does the neural structure grow inside the developing body. The agent shown here was extracted from one evolutionary run after two hours. At this point, artificial ontogeny has discovered how to grow the brain and body of the agent together to achieve an inchworm method of locomotion. This agent is a descendant of the previous one and appeared in the evolving population after a further two hours had elapsed. Here, evolution has discovered that increased mass allows the agent to exert more force against the block. Also, the inchworm method of locomotion has been modified to create a long appendage that pushes against the block. White units contain both sensors and motors. Light gray units contain only sensors. The dark gray units contain only motors, and the black units are empty and only provide structural support. The combination of different types of units within a single agent indicates that cell differentiation has occurred. A genetic algorithm based on genetic regulatory networks 
was designed to first grow and then evaluate each agent from among a population of potential solutions. This agent was taken from a separate evolutionary run. In this run, artificial ontogeny discovers that pushing against the block with two points of contact instead of one is a much better strategy. Like the appendages this. support one another by lying across each other. These three agents, taken together, demonstrate that genetic regulatory networks can be used to design all aspects of an autonomous agent, including the body shape and size, the material from which the agent is constructed, the numbers and distribution of sensors and motors, and the construction of neural structure, which is distributed across the agent's body. The genetic regulatory networks are necessary because they allow evolution to grow, but also to modify different parts of the agent's body at the same time. Thus, changes to one component do not disrupt the other components. Okay, thank you, Nathan. So I think this is a very impressive illustration of the power of artificial evolution, especially if applied to co-evolving morphology and control. Now, what's interesting, just looking, you saw this inchworm-like uh, movement at the beginning of the video, and what's interesting is that there is no centralized controller, but there is only local control, and what's exploited is the interaction with the neighbors, so that sensors here are of the neighbors are stimulated through the physical contact here, which then actuates this motor unit, which in turn actuates the sensor unit because it gets into contact and in this way you get the inchworm movement of locomotion which has all been discovered by artificial evolution has not been programmed into the system so this type of locomotion pattern is entirely emergent from the evolutionary process and that's one of the things we're looking for in artificial evolution things that we as engineers would not necessarily think about if we were to design the system at the here and now perspective. And this is Bongard's evolutionary scheme. So in the genotype, rather than having the parameters of the phenotype, as in Carl Sims, you know, where we had the length of the segments, we had these graph structures, here we have the parameters of the genetic regulatory network, we have the ontogenetic development with transcription factors, we have the phenotype selection. Again, this is the same as in Carl Sims's approach. And then we have reproduction and mutation. And just to give you a very rough idea of what we mean by a genetic regulatory network. So the way this is done is uh, uh, Josh Bongar took a string, I think, of a thousand um, uh, uh, real numbers and then Ten, I think about 10% were coding regions, so were genes. So about 10% of these, which, which is then uh, roughly uh, 100, they were the beginning of genes. And the others are called non-coding regions, sometimes also called junk DNA, because people uh, aren't quite sure what that junk DNA is actually for, but interestingly, people find more, researchers find more and more interesting functionality in this so-called junk DNA, which is not really, doesn't really seem to be junk. Well, in any case, so here we have the genes, and a gene consists of a promoter region, and then we had many versions of this uh, system. Here, in this example, five parameters. The first parameter is the transcription factor to which this gene is sensitive, by which transcription factor it is regulated. This is the transcription factor which is emitted by, produced by the gene if it's activated. This is the lower threshold, this is the upper threshold, and this is the amount of this transcription factor which is actually produced. And this gives a very complex dynamics in the network that is, uh, you, you can, uh, is described on the web page. Uh, we indicate the literature there. Okay, 
this was a very brief introduction to this phylogenetic uh, perspective, but as you saw, using this, we can actually generate agents here at this level, real phenotypes that interact with the environment. So this is also, and you saw that this locomotion pattern, that's this arrow uh, of emergence. There are a number of principles for artificial evolution. Very important, we always work with populations. If you don't have a population, evolution is not going to work. Cumulative selection is fundamental. You don't understand cumulative selection, you don't understand evolution. We have brain-body co-evolution. I mean, in, in nature, in nature, you never have an isolated brain as in the brain in the vat. But you always have the brain as part of a physical organism that had to interact or has to interact with the environment, survive in the environment and reproduce in the environment. Then there's this idea of scalable complexity that you want to be able to grow more complex agents over evolutionary time. And you don't want it to be too disruptive but you want to have smooth development and minimal designer bias. If you use evolution, then you want to exploit the power of evolution. So there is, you want to minimally influence the evolutionary process. You can read about this in chapter six of how the body shapes the way we think. Uh, there is a bit of additional slide material at the end and please watch the Carl Sims video. And if we have a volunteer for the brain in a vat, then uh, let me know. So this is the end of lecture seven. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We can, we can have maybe some questions now if there is time and if you like. I added a few slides, you know, for self-study explaining now here cumulative selection the example by Richard Dawkins. You know, if you if a monkey is randomly typing at the keyboard, and then at some point there is a certain probability that you will actually get actual sentences of the English language, something, something like this. And then he says, okay, let's just take one sentence, you know, which is much less than the whole of Hamlet because the probability that this monkey will ever type the complete play of Hamlet is uh, virtually zero, much, much, uh, would take much longer than the estimated duration of the universe. Now here, you know, he explains, it is explained how this cumulative selection works. And then there is an explanation of Bongard's block pushers, how this these local reflexes come about and the transcription factors and the explanation of what these various components mean. Okay, well, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. If there are questions, just open your microphone and start speaking. seems that there are no questions, so uh, on behalf of the Global Virtual Lecture Hall, I would like to thank Rolf for his guest lecture.